I can't believe it, but Netflix actually did what many believe to be impossible. Upon failed attempt after failed attempt to adequately translate popular anime and manga franchises into a live-action medium, Netflix has just produced, bar none, the most faithful and impressive live-action adaptation of them all. Easily one of the greatest long-running shonen series of all time, Eiichiro Oda's One Piece, with all its complex world-building, its vast gallery of characters, and all its over-the-top camp, it was difficult to imagine this ever working in live-action. But show captains Matt Owens, Steve Maeda, and their crew, along with a firm guiding hand by Oda himself, charted a course for this series to reach the grand line of Netflix shows. This will undoubtedly go down among Netflix's Holy Grail series with the likes of Stranger Things, Squid Games, Wednesday, and Too Hot to Handle. To be honest, this series introduced me to the world of One Piece, and I've since fallen in love with the manga, and I'm now beginning my journey in catching up on the anime. And like all the franchises I've fallen in love with, it's now time for me to take a crack at the timeline. Welcome to Geek Critique. My name is Dakota, and today I'll be your navigator as we set a course to mapping out the entire timeline of the live-action Netflix series by putting all the flashbacks in order and recapping all the major events that occur throughout the first season. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to drop a like, subscribe for more, and maybe check out some of my other timelines right after this. There will be four distinct sections to this video, not unlike the four C's in One Piece. In the first section, we'll explore the recent history of the One Piece world through flashbacks, quotes, and more. The second will be a dissection of what we know about the mysterious timeline of the manga, while the third part will dive into how small details and dates shown in the live-action series might actually change what we know about the overall One Piece timeline. And lastly, we'll do a full recap of the first season. If you haven't watched the first season of Netflix's One Piece yet, beware of spoilers. Our journey begins over 50 years before Luffy first set sail to become King of the Pirates, with a quote from Vice Admiral Garp. I joined the Marines over 50 years ago. Garp began his life in the Marines with the same naivety and fervor for justice that cadets like Kobe now pursue. He may not look it, but in the manga, Garp is set to be 76 years of age, and I'm assuming he's roughly around the same age in the Netflix series, if he's been with the Marines for 50 years. In Logtown, 22 years ago, the Pirate King Gold Roger turns himself in to the Marines. The world government attempts to set an example by publicly executing him to discourage further piracy. But this act unwittingly had the opposite effect. In attendance of Gold Roger's execution are hundreds of pirates and marines alike, including Dracul Mihawk, Red-Haired Shanks, and Smoker, whom we only catch a glimpse of at the end of the first season. Before his execution, Gold Roger claimed to the audience that his treasure is hidden at sea, and that it's now theirs to find. Gold Roger's final words changed the world forever. A new age was born, the Great Pirate Era. I think it's interesting to note that Gold Roger's original name in the manga was Gold D. Roger, and that it was, for some reason, changed for the Netflix series. About four years later, or roughly 18 years prior to the start of the show, a young marine named Belle Mare and her unit were dispatched to engage pirates in the Oikot Kingdom, and they were all but defeated. In the aftermath of that battle, Belle Mare finds a two-year-old Nojiko and an infant Nami, and adopts them as her own children. I gathered the 18 years ago time frame from the manga, but it's quite possible this time period was moved up a bit for the show, seeing as how Nojiko and Nami look a few years older than they're depicted in the manga. Ten years before the start of the show, we have a seven-year-old Luffy dreaming about becoming a pirate during his time at Windmill Village. Red-haired Shanks and his crew have called the small village their home for a time, and Luffy aspires to be just like them, scars and all. He stabs himself in the face to prove to Shanks that he has what it takes to become a pirate, but upon Shanks telling him that he must stay in the village, Luffy eats one of the rare devil fruits, the gum gum fruit, bestowing him with incredible stretchy powers. Shortly after being kidnapped by another pirate and almost eaten alive by a giant sea beast, Shanks saved him, losing an arm in the process. Before Shanks and his crew leave Windmill Village for good, Shanks gives Luffy his own signature hat. This hat's the most precious thing I own means the world to me, and I want you to take it." After Shanks leaves, Vice Admiral Garp begins his years-long attempt to sway Luffy away from piracy and veer him towards a life among Marines. But Luffy isn't having any of it. Nine years ago, on a passenger ship named Orbit, the Cook Pirates, led by Red Leg Zeph, take over the vessel just as a storm capsizes it. 
only the pirate Zeph and a young boy named Sanji, with dreams of becoming a great chef and finding the legendary All Blue, survive the crash. Stranded on a rock at sea for 85 days, Zef hands Sanji a bag of food rations, while he keeps only a bag full of riches for himself. Zef must eat one of his own legs to survive. Eight years ago, a young Nami gets her first real taste at thievery after stealing the book The Historical Atlas of the East Blue. More on this book later, as it carries inside it some very intriguing dates. She eventually returns the book. Arlong and his pirates attack Coco Village and force them to pay a protection racket, 100,000 berry per adult and 50,000 for each child. After being unable to pay for her children, Belmare sacrifices herself for Nami and Nojiko. Arlong also uproots a hut and flips it over and, for some reason, nobody fixes it for over 8 years? Nami goes to Arlong afterwards and makes an agreement with him that until she could fork up 100 million berry to buy the village back from the pirate, she would pledge her life to his cause and make him maps which would help him conquer the East Blue. Seven years ago, a young Usopp takes up the mantle of the town crier of Syrup Village. But everything he cries, namely that pirates are coming, is a lie, so he also assumes the mantle of the town liar. He would go about doing this seemingly every day. Meanwhile, in Shimotsuki Village, a young Roronoa Zoro trains to become a great swordsman, but is regularly beaten by his sensei's daughter, Kuina. After she beats him in one of their duels, they make a pact with each other. Let's fight every day. We'll keep getting better and stronger until one of us becomes the greatest. Kuina sadly doesn't get to live to see that happen, and Zoro asks his sensei if he can fulfill their promise to each other by accepting her rare blade, the Wado Ichimonji. Back in Syrup Village, after presumably several months of lying to the villagers, Usopp's mother dies in front of him. Six years ago, after about two years as his prisoner, Arlong frees Nami of her restraints. He let me stop wearing them when I was 12. Said it was a birthday gift. Three years ago, after it seemed as though he was finally going to be captured, Kuro of the Thousand Plans fakes his own death and Axehan Morgan takes credit for it. I alone defeated the Black Cat Pirates. I alone captured Kuro of the Thousand Plants. Kuro leaves his Black Cat Pirates for a time and pretends to be a butler who came from nothing and is taken in by a wealthy family in Serap Village. He serves them for three years. Let's just say it has been an honor to repay their kindness and yours by serving you these past three years. Roughly two years ago, Kaya's parents die at sea. Her parents died a few years ago and she took it pretty hard and Notably, the manga claims they died only one year prior to the events of the series, but this seems to be changed somewhat for the live action. After their death, Mary assumes the role of managing Kaya's shipyard until she comes of age. Kuro, now the butler Klahador, begins poisoning Kaya slowly, and she falls ill. Elsewhere in the East Blue, Captain Elvita captures a young teenager named Kobe, whom she forces to work on her ship for some two years. While they don't claim he's been with Alvita for two years in the live-action series, it is explicitly mentioned in the manga and anime. That was two years ago. And that's the entire known history of the Netflix One Piece show, as it stands so far. Now, before we dive into a complete recap of the first eight episodes, let's try to suss out exactly which year this series takes place in. The timeline of One Piece is quite well-defined, but it isn't terribly specific. If you're anything like me, stuff like 22 years ago, 10 years ago, 7 years ago is fine, but being able to place an actual year date to something is far more satisfying. For instance, if I say I was born 22 years after the moon landing, and you know the moon landing occurred in 1969, you can then infer my year of birth. Well, I tried using that same line of logic with the One Piece live action, and I had significant trouble because of the wide range of dates I encountered. So I went to the manga for answers. Wouldn't you know it, actual year dates in the manga are even more rare than in the live action, it seems. There are now 106 printed volumes of the One Piece manga, and there does not appear to be more than a handful of actual year dates scattered throughout the whole of over 1,094 chapters. More mysteriously, there is no hard and fast year we can readily attribute the present to beyond fan assumptions. Let me explain. In our real world, we have a number of calendar systems. Solar calendars like the Gregorian and Julian, lunar calendars like the Hedri, and lunisolar calendars like the Hebrew and Chinese. But in One Piece, we know of only two calendars. The Tenreki calendar, also known as the Age of Heaven, and the Kainreki calendar, also known as the Age of the Sea Circle. It's this second one, the Age of the Sea Circle, or Kayan, 
that best pertains to the modern story of One Piece. The only way that fans have been able to roughly calculate when One Piece is set is through a tale set well in the past, following an explorer named Mont Blanc Noland. In chapter 228 of the manga and episode 148 of the anime, we learn the present day is about 400 years after the year 1120. This logbook is over 400 years old! June 21st, year 1120. Again in chapter 287, or episode 187, we learn Nolan's adventures in 1122 were about 400 years before the present day. The following tale took place long, long ago, some 400 years in the past. So, the closest answer fans have been able to discover as to when Luffy first set sail in the present day is about 1522, or exactly 400 years after 1122 of the Age of the Sea Circle. The only issue is, 400 years is an extremely round number, so it might not be the most specific indicator. What about the live action series? Does Netflix's One Piece have any dates that help corroborate what fans assume to be the present year of 1522? Well, yes and no. You see, a number of years are showcased throughout the series on certain objects that definitely fall in that 400 plus year bracket, but they tend to be quite a few years later than 1522. The first such date, in episode 3, is an old bottle of wine that Zoro picks up in the cellar of Kaya's mansion, notably dated to 1542, over 20 years later than fans assumed the series to actually occur. Later, in episode 7, we get a look inside the historical atlas of the East Blue that Nami stole. There are many years in here, dating back many centuries if you look at this legend, but the only legible years appear to be mid-16th century, from 1559 to 1578. This leans closer to almost 450 years after Mont Blanc Nolan's travels in the 1120s. And later still, in episode 8, we see a much younger bottle of wine from Coco Village dated to 1601. I spent a long time trying to determine whether these dates featured in the show were intentional indicators of the timeline, or if this was a simple mistake or oversight on the prop department's behalf. There is some significant reason to believe these aren't just arbitrary year dates, though. Note this date, 1578, followed by ASC. That's an abbreviation of the rarely named calendar The Age of the Sea Circle, and it's an incredibly thought out detail for such a short and seemingly insignificant scene. We also know that Eiichiro Oda was a huge help in getting everything right for this series. Could this in any way be a hint from Oda that the timeline that fans have assumed to be legit isn't wholly accurate, or is it easier to just assume that the manga is still closer to the truth of it? All the dates I found were over 400 years old, yes, but none had yet inched past the 500 year later century mark that surely would have proven the live action series timeline to be incorrect. As an example of what I mean, if I claimed that the first settlement in the US was over 400 years ago, but really it was 436 years ago, I'd still be roughly correct if we're only counting the complete centuries that have elapsed. But is One Piece actually closer on the timeline to the early 17th century, as is featured on this bottle of wine? I honestly don't know, but if you have any ideas, please leave them in the comments below. As it stands, I no longer feel comfortable believing 1522 to be the year that Luffy first set sail to become King of the Pirates, but I also don't have enough information to confirm whether the dates in this show were intentional or not. For now, we'll just have to stick to the X number of years ago format for our visual timeline. Also, if you're interested in downloading a large PNG of this timeline graphic, it's available to grab now from my members over at Patreon. And if you liked this video so far, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Now, let's recap the main events of the first season. Present Day, Episode 1, Romance Dawn. A 17-year-old Luffy finally sets sail to find the One Piece and become King of the Pirates. Remember the name, because I'm going to be King of the Pirates. His boat sinks after a single day at sea, and he survives by shoving himself into a barrel, which is summarily picked up by Alvida's crew. He breaks free of the barrel, and after facing off against Alvida and her pirates, he and the captive Kobe break free and make their way to Shellstown. In pursuit of a map to the Grand Line, Luffy meets the pirate hunter Roanoa Zoro and the thief Nami along the way. Nami also happens to be in search for the map to the Grand Line, so their paths converge, as she and Luffy steal the map from Axe Hand Morgan's office. Choosing instead to help Luffy and Nami escape over living out a seven-day sentence without food or water, Zoro aids the two in their fight against Axan Morgan and his marines. Kobe decides not to join the three Straw Hat pirates to instead pursue a life as a marine. 
Present Day, Episode 2, The Man in the Straw Hat Vice Admiral Garp diverts his plan from hunting the Baroque Works pirates to instead chase Luffy and the Straw Hats. Meanwhile, Luffy and his crew are captured by Buggy's pirate crew, whom we learn have been hatching a plan to steal the map to the Grand Line for some time. I've been scheming for months to steal that map from old Axe Hand. Moron! Luffy swallows the map before it can be taken from them. Imprisoned and tortured for a time, Luffy and company eventually break free and face off against Buggy, who apparently is also a devil fruit eater and can separate his body into any number of pieces. They defeat the clown pirate by capturing his individual limbs and keeping him separated, and they then free the villagers that Buggy had chained up. Elsewhere in the East Blue, Kobe meets Vice Admiral Garp on his first day as a Marine, and after seeing something of himself in Kobe, he takes the young cadet under his wing. Since the execution of Gold Roger, we have been fighting an unending war against piracy. Present Day, Episode 3, Tell No Tales. In need of a bigger ship, and one with less leakage, the three Straw Hats make their way to Syrup Village, where Luffy plans to simply ask for a ship, while Nami plans instead to steal one. They meet Usopp, who takes them to Kaya's mansion, the person who owns the entire shipyard. It's the eve of her 18th birthday, when the shipyard reverts back to her full ownership. 18 years old? I can hardly believe it. The Straw Hats are invited to dinner and are asked to stay the night. Unbeknownst to them all, Kaya's butler and her other staff are actually Kuro and his black cat pirates, who have been planning to kill Kaya on the day she turns 18, so they can effectively steal her wealth and take her fleet of ships. Mary is killed, Zoro is knocked out and thrown down a well, Luffy drinks all the poison that has been slowly poisoning Kaya, and Usopp goes and cries about there being pirates. Sadly, nobody believes him. Nobody, it seems, except Kobe, who's been tasked to capture Luffy. Present Day, Episode 4, The Pirates Are Coming Usopp tells Kobe and Helmeppo that Kuro is currently taking Kaya and Luffy captive, but even the Marines are finding it hard to believe Kuro is alive. My father, Axehan Morgan, killed him years ago. Luffy, now unconscious after consuming all of the pirates' poison, is given to the Marines to get them to stop inquiring about pirates at the mansion. Usopp runs over to Kaya's room to warn her of Clahador's plan to kill her. The pirates lock down the mansion and Kuro attempts to hunt them down now that it's past midnight. Nami overhears them and also comes to Kaya's aid. Roronoa Zoro finds the strength to climb his way out of the well through the power of flashbacks and apprehends the marines who've taken Luffy into custody and the two of them return to the mansion to face off against the pirates. After the three Straw Hats and Usopp defeat Kuro and save Kaya's life, she gifts them with a ship of their choosing, and they name it after her oldest friend who was killed the previous night. The ship is called the Going Mary, and Captain Usopp joins their crew. Upon setting sail, Vice Admiral Garp fires at Luffy's new ship, and Luffy calls the old man his Grandpa. Grandpa? Grandpa? Present Day, Episode 5, Eat at Baratie. Luffy uses his stretchy powers to take out one of the masts on the Vice Admiral's ship, and the Straw Hats get away. Luffy smells food on the wind, and the Going Merry makes its way to the Baratier, a restaurant on the water, and probably the coolest practical set I've ever seen in my life. One of the cook staff, Sanji, is punished to wait tables after he disagrees with the chef's cooking. Meanwhile, Garp sends one of the seven warlords of the sea, Dracul Mihawk, to find and capture Luffy. Together, the Straw Hat crew takes a well-earned break to grab a meal, a meal which Luffy enthusiastically puts on credit, a credit which the owner of the restaurant, Zeph, enthusiastically rejects. Luffy is made to wash dishes to pay off their tab. You gotta remember something, the meal you had with your friends? That's one year's worth of dishes. Nami, finally in a position to pay off her debt with Arlong, plans to leave the Straw Hats at dawn on the next day. That is, until Mihawk comes to the Baratie seeking Luffy, and Zoro challenges him to a duel to the death. Mihawk is the best swordsman in the world, better with a blade than anyone in living history. By defeating Mihawk, Zoro can fulfill his oath to his dead friend Kuina, and Luffy, never one to stop someone from following their dreams, allows the duel to continue. Mihawk defeats Zoro the following morning, and leaves Luffy and the crew to tend to Zoro's wounds. Present Day, Episode 6, The Chef and the Chore Boy Considering the closest doctor is some two days sail away, and Zoro is bleeding out quickly, Luffy barges into the restaurant asking for help. Zef staunches the wounds using fish skin and Zoro's health stabilizes. The crew take turns trying to talk to Zoro while he's unconscious, as Luffy comes to grips with the fact that Zoro is partially in this position because of his leadership style. Arlong makes his way into the Baratie looking for Luffy, whom he believes stole his map to the Grand Line. 
they were able to track him because Buggy planted an ear in Luffy's hat. Arlong and Luffy fight, destroying much of the interior of the Baratie, and Nami betrays Luffy to leave alongside Arlong, telling Arlong to simply drop Luffy in the water. Being a devil fruit eater, his greatest weakness is his inability to swim in seawater, but Sanji comes to his rescue. Zoro begins to wake up after the fight. Sanji joins their crew in an emotional departure from Zeph, and the four of them head out in search of Nami, through the help of the abandoned head of Buggy the Pirate. Why are we bringing the waiter? Present Day, Episode 7, The Girl with the Sawfish Tattoo. Buggy guides the Straw Hats to the Konomi Islands, which happens to be where Arlong Park and Nami's small hometown, Coco Village, are located. Vice Admiral Garp, now a day or so behind the Straw Hats, makes his way to the Baratier where he shares a meal with Zeph, a pirate he has had dealings with in the past. There's a new generation and they're coming up. It's their time now. During their celebration of retrieving the map to the Grand Line, Arlong sends Nami to collect the taxes of the people of Coco Village. The villagers hate Nami as they feel she's betrayed them for the fishermen that's enslaved the town. Luffy and friends see the villagers give Nami everything they have, but they're still short. Pushing Luffy away again, Nami returns to deliver the news to Arlong as well as the news that she's now in possession of the requisite 100 million berry. Luffy and friends convince Nojiko to tell them Nami's story over a good meal, and they learn about how her mother died. Meanwhile, Arlong coerces Nezumi and the other corrupt marines to retrieve Nami's stash of berry, all while burning Coco Village to the ground. Nami realizes she will need her friend's help. Luffy. Help me. Of course I will. Present Day, Episode 8, The Worst in the East For whatever reason, the Straw Hats wait until the sun comes up the next day before they go into town and assess the damage. Alongside Nami, the crew take on Arlong and his fishermen pirates, each member getting their moment to shine. Nami! You are our friend! We are your crew! The Marines get wind that Arlong destroyed Coco Village, and Nezumi blames the Straw Hat pirates. While celebrating their victory, not only of freeing the town, but retrieving the map to the Grand Line, as well as Nami, Vice Admiral Garp comes and gives Luffy one final fight to test his willingness to go down the path that Luffy's chosen, the path of a pirate. Luffy passes, and Garp lets them go. Shortly thereafter, before Luffy and the crew make their journey to the Grand Line, a bounty is put on Luffy's head of 30 million berry, the highest in the East Blue. His crew presents him with a sail that boasts a smiling Jolly Roger in a straw hat, and they each reaffirm their dreams to one another as they set sail for the Grand Line. The total time elapsed in the first season, from Luffy's first day at sea to the point where Luffy gets his bounty, is likely less than a week. It's plausible that there are some unseen days at sea, but the way the episodes flow into one another doesn't make that seem likely. Apparently, only 45 days elapse in the first 325 episodes of the anime, which is insane to think about, but the logic likely translates to the live action somewhat. Certain timeline indicators like the lunar phases aren't very trustworthy, as they're more often than not simple references to the manga. So it's fair to say all these events happened in quick succession. And that's our timeline and recap for the first season of Netflix's incredible live action One Piece adaptation. I hope you enjoyed the video. Remember, if you'd like to download this visual timeline guide to the first season, you can grab this and other graphics on my Patreon for just a dollar a month. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and let me know your thoughts. Should we trust the dates featured in the live action, or do you think they were a mistake? Thanks guys. Check out other timeline videos from other franchises right now. Long live the timeline.